there are so many benefits beyond just helping a kid learn how to read. Reading with your kids is a great way to help them develop their empathy. It's a great way for them to kind of imagine how they would deal with different situations in life. Books can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, giving kids a chance to see themselves portrayed positively on the pages of the books. Welcome to the Midland Money Mindset. This is a podcast that's all about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. In every episode, we go deep with engaging guests who provide tangible takeaways and a whole lot of joy along the way. I hope you enjoy these conversations as much as I enjoyed having them. Let's dive into today's show. I'm Larry Sprung, your host for the Midland Money Mindset and founder and wealth advisor of Midland Financial. Today's guest is Jed Doherty, host of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Jed Doherty is a former licensed certified social worker who is known throughout the world as Jedley. Starting in 1983, Jedley has brought a magical message of caring and community to millions of hearts through his on-stage performances at schools, libraries, and churches throughout the U.S. and Puerto Rico. In 2017, Jedley launched the Reading With Your Kids podcast. He knew that his relationship and the ongoing conversations he has with his now adult kids began decades ago while reading together. The podcast's mission is to help families grow closer through reading and introduces parents, caregivers, and educators to authors of all genres of children's literature. Since its debut, the podcast has published almost 1,500 episodes. Not only has the show been downloaded to hundreds of countries throughout the world, but it has been downloaded to every continent on the planet, including Antarctica. The show was nominated for the iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast Award and received an AVA Digital Award. Past guests include some of the most influential authors in the world, including LeVar Burton, Kate DiCamillo, Jerry Spinelli, and hundreds more. Listen in for some great takeaways about the power of reading and how it can impact a person and a family for generations to come. Well, hello, everybody. Larry Sprung here. I have the pleasure today of being with Jed Doherty, the host of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Thanks for joining us today, Jed. Hey, Larry. Thanks for having me. Delighted to be here. Yeah, it's great. So listen, I want to give our audience, our listeners, an idea of who you are. Can you tell us who Jed Doherty is? I'm a very old man who uh, got very lucky and married an absolutely beautiful wife. We've had a wonderful family. Spent 30 years traveling around the country, performing in schools as Jedley, doing magic and clowning and having so much fun. And about five years ago, I launched the Reading With Your Kids podcast, and it has been an absolute delight. I have met so many amazing kids authors and really developed loads of friendships. And I just feel like I'm one of the luckiest guys in the world. Well, sounds like you're having a lot of fun. That's for sure. So can't beat that. I am. I am. It's been a blessing. So I have to ask you, because you didn't mention this in your remarks as far as who you are. At one point, you were a social worker, I believe, working in the criminal justice system. So how does somebody who's a social worker working in the criminal justice system end up hosting a top-ranked podcast. How does that come to be? Uh, it has been a long, strange road. Coming out of college, I did. Uh, I was working as a social worker in the uh, juvenile justice system here in Massachusetts, and I burnt out and was uh, kind of at a crossroads in my life, didn't know what I was going to do. I knew I couldn't continue on being a social worker. It was just taking a beating on my psyche and my outlook on life and my physical health. and knelt down and prayed and say, Lord, what do you want me to do? Mm -hmm. And didn't get an answer right away, but I sat down at the table and I, I was reading the newspaper. And the first article that I could focus on was an article saying that Ringling Brothers and Bonham and Bailey Circus was in town that day having auditions for clowns. And I looked <laughs> up to heaven and I said, dude, really? <laughs> and I went and I auditioned and I did really well. I was invited back to audition down in uh, New York City and in a couple of other cities. And 
while I was waiting to hear back on their decision, I started studying theater arts in Boston and discovered that I could go out and address the same kind of things that I was trying to address with kids as a social worker on stage. And and instead of trying to help kids rebuild their lives after making mistakes, I could encourage them to make healthy choices through magic, through comedy, through clowning. And then I was hooked and wow. doing that for over 30 years. And it's a real joy. So where did the genesis from the podcast come? Because I'm assuming, you know, you were clowning for a while. Well, it seems like you went from a very stress-filled job to one that was really energized and fun. And then where did the podcast emanate from in terms of that kind of timeline? I was always a fan of talk radio. I was one of those kids that when I went to bed, I snuck that little transistor radio underneath my pillow and would listen to talk show host here in Boston. There was one in particular, uh, Larry Glick, who would talk to the most interesting people in the world, folks who had been abducted by aliens and authors. <laughs> and, you know, it was just crazy fun. And I thought this would be something that I would love to do. And so when podcasting became a thing, I thought, why not? And did a couple of podcasts before the Reading With Your Kids podcast. When I was looking to launch a new project, I was sitting down and thinking, what's made the biggest difference in my life and in my family's life? And I realized it was, it was the time that I spent reading to my kids when they were young, when they were curled up on my lap and when me and my beautiful wife would be curled up in bed with both kids, we'd be reading books. And that time spent reading together was the foundation for a lifelong conversation that continues today. My kids are wonderful adults of 26 and 29, and we still talk about books and movies and television shows. Sure. And, and I wanted to share that with other parents, just letting them know that, that that bond, they can experience the same joy that we have. And it starts by reading with your kids. And it evidently taken off because you're, you know, the proof is in the pudding is one of the top ranked podcasts for sure. So where does your passion for children's literature, kid lit come from? I mean, obviously it comes from you being able to experience those times you did with your kids, but there's got to be a passion there kind of greater than that even to continue this podcast and instill upon others the excitement and joy that you and your family have gotten from it. I've learned so much over this. You know, I came in wanting to share with parents just the importance that building that relationship. I've since discovered that there are so many benefits beyond just helping a kid learn how to read. Reading with your kids is a great way to help them develop their empathy. It's a great way for them to kind of imagine how they would deal with different situations in life. Books can be mirrors, windows, and sliding glass doors, giving kids a chance to see themselves portrayed positively on the page of the books. Also, and I think just as importantly, giving kids an opportunity to see kids who are different, maybe come from different cultures, speak different languages, uh, different races, different lifestyles. Having kids see other people and understanding that deep down, we are all part of that same beautiful human family. Right. I think that's great. And it's a great teaching point. I know in our home, we talk about and, and still reference, and this was a long time ago because my kids are turning 16 and 19 shortly here. And we still quote from The Very Hungry Caterpillar, right? Which was a very early on children's book that we read to our kids at a very young age. And to this day, like if one of my kids or even myself is having one of those days where the fridge can't stay closed and you're eating a lot of food, I'm like, hey, I'm feeling like I'm having a very hungry caterpillar day. And we still, to this day, reference that book. And like you are laughing right now, it gives us a chuckle and it kind of throws us back to that time where we were all sitting together around and reading that book. So that's invaluable, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And books, you know, you folks are deal, deal with money and, and helping people develop a financial security. One of the things that we've really stressed on the podcast, every chance we've had an opportunity is to just remind parents that books are a great way to help their kids become financially literate and mm -hmm. have those conversations that it doesn't seem like anybody's having with their kids. 
Yeah, we actually know a, a gentleman who started his own children's book. I believe it's called Sammy Rabbit. And it's all about the financial impacts and trying to instill good habits into young kids. Because just like that reference to that very hungry caterpillar, those stories make impressions on very young kids, children, and they remain with them kind of in perpetuity. You know, this very hungry caterpillar reference will be something that now 19 and 16 years later effectively is still a reference point that we're using. And if we can instill upon our kids from a financial aspect too, and even some of those other areas that you mentioned, you know, talking about inclusivity and looking at different ways that people, their households, how they different, you know, are different, et cetera, that'll stay with those kids, you know, in perpetuity and really makes an impression for a very long time. So, I mean, is that really, that's really your ultimate driver and your passion behind the podcast, I would imagine, right? Is have that impression upon those kids in order to have something to take with them in perpetuity and impress upon the parents that this is an important thing, an important part of their growth. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things that that we remind parents is that they are their kids' first and most important teacher. And a lot of parents don't feel comfortable. I'm not a teacher. I don't know how to teach my kids. So that's all right, because there are so many great books out there that you can use to help you instill values in your kids that that you want them to just hold and live by. Yeah, I agree. And we talk a lot, obviously, one of the things, and, and you brought it up yourself, one of the topics that's been talked about heavily is we have to teach more about finance in school, right? Well, maybe that'll happen. Maybe it won't. I know Florida recently instituted a mandatory financial education component to their public education program. Maybe that'll be good. Maybe it won't. I mean, something's better than nothing at this point. But at the same time, I think it's important upon parents to also take on that responsibility and look for tools and books that might be able to help them instill those concepts into their kids. So. I think it's important. Yeah. Well, one of the things parents don't realize is that while we might not be consciously talking to our kids about money, that we're talking to our kids about money all the time, our behavior and with our words. And also when we're sitting down with our kids, the way a lot of parents do, talking to kids about, oh, you got to get into a great college, got to get into a great college. And kids are hearing that when they're four or five years old and they don't hear but you got to make good decisions about what college you go to and how much you're going to spend. And kids come out owing 150, 200, whatever it is, thousand dollars. And we got to give them a, a hand. I agree. We could have a whole other show about this path that we set our kids on because intuitively I do not feel and having kids who are near and going to college currently I don't believe college is for everybody. There are kids who are unsure about what they want to do and they have no clue and college may not be ideal for them. It may be best for them to go find work and figure out where they want to be and then cater their education to it. Or listen, there are plenty of great trades schools and trades for people to get into that I think we've gotten away from for a very long time that hopefully we get back into. But Again, that could be a whole whole nother show. So I want to know a little bit more about the podcast. How do you go about selecting authors that appear on the podcast? If an author, because we have authors as part of our practice, if an author wants to appear on your podcast, how do they go about doing it? What's that selection process for you? If somebody is listening to this and they wrote a great kid's book, whether it's a board book, a picture book, a middle grade novel, even YA titles, the first step is to visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. There's an author's click here button at the top of the page. And if they click on that, they can scroll down to a little tab that says, be a guest. And it starts with sending me a, a pitch. If you are an author and if you are listening, a pitch isn't, hi, I wrote a kid's book. And I'd love to be on your podcast. <laughs> As in, how did I need to know about you and about your book? And also about why my audience is going to want to listen to you. We want really dynamic, interesting guests on the podcast. And and we've been able to bring those guests to our audience. And you don't need to be famous. You don't need to be a New York Times bestselling author. We just need you to be you and interesting and, and be passionate. 
What has been or what have been some of your better authors that you've brought on that, uh, you know, have been really exciting? You walked away. Wow, this is a great experience. What have they done on the show and what have they talked about? Or maybe it was the book itself that was just the wow factor that kind of filtered through that whole episode. Oh, boy, we've had so many, many guests. LeVar Burton was one of our first big name guests. And that was such a trip. He was so important to you know, in terms of advocating reading for generations. Sure. I had an interesting guest on who wrote a book. One of the neat things about the podcast is that I know where I'm, I'm, I start. I kind of know where I want to end. I have no idea where we're going to go in, in the middle. <laughs> and so I had this uh, guest on who wrote a book about a caterpillar. And I thought, and he mentioned that he was dyslexic. So I knew that we were eventually going to go and talk about dyslexia and what that was like growing up. And then I said what I thought was a really softball pitch. I said, why did you choose a caterpillar who turned into a butterfly to be the main character of your book? And I'm expecting, well, I want kids to learn that they can flourish and grow and do wonderful things with their lives. And instead, <laughs> what I got was, well, this book was dedicated to Mandy and Joey who were murdered by their father when they were five years old. Oh, boy. And I'm like, well, I didn't see that coming. But that led to a really fascinating conversation about domestic violence and mental illness and how people who are experiencing mental illness aren't getting the, the help that they need. And we never would have had that conversation if I hadn't have asked <laughs> that question. Yeah, uh, not where I thought that was going either. <laughs> so uh, a little bit of a blind side for me too on this show, and I wasn't even interviewing yeah. that person. But listen, I agree. Mental health is very important. Uh, I just completed a, about a 12, 13, 14 year tenure on the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention's board. And I lost, unfortunately, my brother-in-law in 2004 to suicide. So I know how important mental health is. And, you know, that kind of segues into where I wanted to go next, because I know you've traveled the country, as you mentioned, you know, to different schools and performing magic as part of the magic component. And one of the things that I know you were very uh, outspoken about was bullying. How did that come to be? And, and where was your passion behind bullying? Where did that come from? Well, to be honest with you, it was customer driven, had been doing healthy choice shows, you know, say no to drugs, say no to alcohol for many years. And a school in Maine who had my healthy choices show in the past reached out to me and said, hey, we're doing this anti-bullying thing. And could you come up and develop a, a program just to kind of help us kick that off? And I said, sure. This is back in 2003, I think. And the whole big anti-bullying push hadn't really caught on and I hadn't thought much about it. So I looked into what they were doing and I liked it because it was about as much as it was about teaching kids not to bully others. It was also about getting kids to stand up and say something if they see somebody being hurt and, and speaking to teachers and asking for help. And that's the part I really liked so we did that first show for the folks in Maine, and I added that to the choices that schools could make when they were inviting me in. And very quickly, that became the most popular show. And ironically, while I was traveling the country telling kids that they have the right to go to a school where they feel safe, my son was the target of a bully and wasn't telling us. Uh, he would come home and we were seeing changes in his behavior that were concerning to us. And we would talk to him and he would say, no, 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 everything's great. I'm friends with everybody. And then I just happened to be in school one morning at a morning assembly and I saw something that concerned me. And one of the girls who were in the, one of the upper grades, she also started, and she came over to me. She said, hey, did you see what happened? This has been going on. You need to talk to your son. And we did. And we were able to talk to the teachers and the principal. And we got him the help that he needed. And we got, got the kid who was targeting him the help that, that he needed to. So then it, as it hit home to me, that made it more real. So when I was going into schools after that, I had more of a personal connection, I think. Yeah, that's an amazing story. And I'm glad you were able to kind of uncover what was going on in your son's life in order to uh, get them the help that they needed. 
I think there are two things that I kind of take away from what you said. One is the whole upstander, bystander thing in terms of if you see something going on, you have a responsibility to kind of uncover it and say something. And I think there are a lot of good books. I'm kind of at a loss at the moment, but I know there are a lot of good books out there that point to that upstander situation and not just sitting by and being a bystander. Because I think if you're a bystander, you're just really validating whatever's going on instead of saying, hey, this is not right. Mm -hmm. And to your point and what you do, there's a lot of good books that could point to those lessons. And we've read several of those with our kids over the years. And then on the bullying side, I think with the advent of social media and a lot of electronic devices that we have going on, unfortunately, those have really perpetuated a lot of what's going on because it's very easy to sit behind a keyboard, sit behind an Instagram account or a Facebook whatever account and say things that you don't have any consequences for, which has caused even a new level of uh, bullying, you know, cyber bullying. So I thank you for putting on those shows because it's very important. And I'm sure you highlight a lot of books in your and on your show that kind of cater to those two themes. I'm sure there are a lot of them out there, right? There are. And I can't name them off the top. There are too many. And if I leave somebody off, I'll be, <laughs> I'll be in big trouble. But we have, we've addressed through books, we've also addressed the whole issue of cyberbullying and helping our kids become more media literate and helping our kids understand that they are actually consuming. Every time they go online, every time they open up their phone, they're actually consuming media. And just like we have to make healthy choices with what we consume when we sit down and eat, we need to make the same kind of choices when of what kind of media we're going to consume and how we consume it. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you've coined yourself as an educational clown. Can you tell our listeners about that, what you mean by that? It is kind of um, (laughs) an interesting term. I use clowning. I use magic to educate kids. A magician come up to me after one of my shows. His wife was a teacher in a school and and she asked me, she said, oh, can my husband come in and watch your show? And I said, absolutely. He sat in the back. And afterwards, he came up and some people overheard him. And he came up and he shook my hand. He said, I love your show. You prove that you don't have to be the most skilled magician in the world to have a fantastic show. And everybody who heard him thought that he was insulting me. (laughs) And I didn't. I knew exactly what he meant. My passion isn't to be the best magician or the best clown. My passion is to use those talents and abilities to inspire kids to make healthy choices, to treat others with respect and kindness. And if I can go on stage and know how to use this very simple prop to tell a big story and deliver a big message, that's where I want to focus my time. So you're not going to make one of the kids disappear on stage or anything like that, I guess. (laughs) We don't make them disappear, but I do levitate somebody on stage (laughs) in my show. And that's a really wonderful thing. That's cool. So do you have any good stories that you could share with us about an experience that you may have had with a kid that saw you that may have been going through some struggles or some tough times that after seeing you or hearing you that, you know, it kind of changed in in their life for better? A lot, a lot. (laughs) I've had a lot of kids reach out to me after seeing the anti-bullying show and saying, hey, I'm being hurt. This is happening to me. and." I wish they would have been able to go to tell their principal, but it's okay. They talked to me and then I was able to reach out to the principal and get the kid the help. A really neat experience happened to me in at a school in rural Pennsylvania. I was going down and introducing myself to kids before the show started. And one of the things I like to do is to shake hands and say, hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, and say hello in all these different languages. And there was one girl at the end of the first row and I noticed she had a sign language interpreter. And so when I got to her, I used the only sign that I was able to use, which was, you have a beautiful smile. And mm-hmm. that just made her beam. And she was really excited to help during the show and always raising her hand. And I just had this instinct that she was going to do my grand finale. 
And so I invited her up on stage to do the grand finale. And when I let the audience know that she was going to balance herself on top of a chair in a way that they won't believe, her teachers and interpreters freaked out <laughs> running on stage. She said, no, 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 she can't do that. No, no. And I turned to the girl and thankfully she was able to read my lips. And I said, do you trust me? And she's big smile. And she said, absolutely big shake of the head. And I just turned to the teacher and the interpreters and I said, you guys can sit down. And we did this and she levitated on stage and it was wonderful. But the really neat thing was when she came down and when we walked out to take a bow without any prompting from anybody, the kids in the audience applauded her in sign language. They were clapping. They all did the, you know, the hand wiggling thing. And that just brought this huge smile to her face. It was, I don't know it, that it was the first time, but that I looked at her smile and she felt like part of that school family. And that was just a beautiful moment for me to be a part of. Yeah, that's amazing. And I, I think there's a lot of credit to be due to that school and those kids in the school for doing what they did. Yeah. My son, who goes to school in Minnesota now, he started uh, when he was out here in public school on Long Island, but he takes uh, American Sign Language. Mm. And he didn't go the traditional route of Spanish or French or Italian like most of the other kids. They had sign language. And when he moved to another school in Minnesota, to the uh, the boarding school that he's at now, one of the draws was that they also had American Sign Language because he wanted to continue that. And ironically, I guess not ironically, but He's had the opportunity on a, on a few occasions because right around the corner from his school is a school for the deaf. So he's had like DoorDash and Instacart drivers that have come to make a delivery and they are deaf and he signs to them. He had one in particular that didn't know, was trying to communicate. They didn't know what dorm they needed to make the delivery to. And he was able to effectively sign to that person. And he felt so good about the fact that he was able to have and communicate with that person because of sign language. It made him feel like over the moon, that's cool. which is what it's all about, right? Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, so what's up next, right? What do you have? What's the big thing on the horizon for you, Jed Lee? What's the next big thing? Well, we are going to be celebrating. I don't know if it will be after or before folks hear this, but we're going to be celebrating our episode number 1500 wow. sometime in August of 2022. So we're excited about that. We're excited to get back on the road and start touring again. We are keeping our fingers crossed that, that the uh, COVID pandemic is over and kids will be able to get together back in uh, auditoriums and we'll be able to come together and start doing more shows for them. I just can't wait for that to happen. We're looking forward to just spreading the word of how important reading is to, and reading with our kids of all ages. You don't stop reading with your kids when they become readers. Just continue right. to read with them. You know, they're a, kids are able to comprehend on a higher level than they're able to read. So when your kids are reading at a first and a second grade level, pull out a book that's meant for fourth or fifth graders and sit down and read those books and Give your kids a chance to hear more words than they wouldn't normally hear and build a vocabulary. And also just imagine themselves dealing with the different problems that they're going to face in their lives. Yeah, it's amazing what kids can absorb. And as they grow older, the more they can absorb. And it seems like you have a lot of great things coming down and coming up the pike for you. So that's all good stuff. Being that you may and hopefully will be able to start in person presentations and shows again, if an organization wanted to bring you in for that, how does that work? Similarly to the submission for being on the uh, the podcast? Sure. Yes, absolutely. They absolutely can reach out to uh, readingwithyourkids.com. We have a contact button. They can just click on that, send me a message. We also have a link uh, under parents click here. There is a, a link there for to learn how you can bring one of our live events to your community. Awesome. Well, Jed Lee, it's been a pleasure having you on. And we ask every one of our guests the same last question. So you're going to be no different today because this is the Midland Money Mindset. So we want to know, what did you do today that brought you joy and put you in the right mindset for success? I got up and had breakfast with my beautiful wife. 
That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. And it was sunny today, right? And it was sunny today. And just spending that time together, she always jokes, we haven't spent enough time together in the past two years. <laughs> but How long have you been married for? 33 years. Amazing. Yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, just getting up and I think getting up is the first thing. Um, <laughs> uh, sitting down and, and having breakfast and just... Um, Spending time with her just reminds me of how blessed we are, and it just gives me motivation to make the most of every day. Amazing. I think it's a great way to start the day. It's been a pleasure having you on, and we will have all your information in the show notes. But if people want to learn more about Jed Lee and about what you do, what's the easiest place for them to do that? The easiest place is to go to readingwithyourkids.com. Great. Well, we'll have that in the show notes. Like I said, we'll have all your contact information. It's been a pleasure having you on the show and having this great conversation with you, Jed Lee, and make it a great day. Hey, Larry, thanks so much for having me. I want to thank Jed Doherty for being a guest on the Midland Money Mindset. Jed made a career change early on and decided to focus his passions towards having an impact while feeling energized about what he was doing. Jed has created a legacy around reading based upon his own family experiences that now impacts families around the world. Jed understands how reading within his own family had a huge impact and wants others to experience it too. Jed and his podcast, Reading With Your Kids, can be found across all social media platforms and all the contact information needed to find them can be found in the show notes. Thank you for joining us this week on the Midland Money Mindset. Make sure you visit our website at midlandmoneymindset.com and smash the subscribe button so you don't miss a show. We encourage you to help others find our valuable content and please don't keep us a secret. You can also schedule an Is There a Fit call right from our website or by using the link that you'll find in the description section of your podcast player or app. And be sure to join us for our next episode to learn more about getting your mind right when it comes to all things money. The opinions voiced in the Midland Money Mindset Show with Lawrence Sprung are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Investing involves risk, including possible loss of principal. No strategy ensures success or protects against loss. To determine what may be appropriate for you, consult with your attorney, accountant, financial or tax advisor prior to investing. Investment advisory services offered through CWM LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Guests on the Midland Money Mindset Show are not affiliated with CWM LLC.